Welcome back guys to your latest GTA fancast with me, Gully. Um, it's not going to be obviously the most enjoyable one to kind of relive what happened at the weekend, but it has to be done. Um, there's lots to get into, lots to talk about. I feel like there's some really, really interesting things that we can pick out from the game against uh, West Bromwich Albion. And uh, I'll look to get into that now and uh, see what we can decipher from what was probably the most disappointing performance of the whole campaign. So let's get into it, guys. Um, as you can see here, despite our kind of recent run of bad form, um, relative to ourselves anyway, West Brom have been on an even worse run of form. Um, we stuck to our guns, stuck to what uh, a system that we're coming quite familiar with um, in terms of the 4-3-3, and the system that works pretty well against, you know, um, Premier League opposition in the FA Cup pretty recently. So no real qualms about that. I think we are concerned about ourselves defensively. But I think a lot of what went wrong football-wise was to do with some of the intangible stuff around a Black Country derby, the confidence in the team, the fragility, the pressure of the situation, which Nuno insisted on putting it on him, himself in, in the sense that he made it a must-win game pre-match. And I think I want to view this game kind of through the prism of all the players that got dragged, three very influential players, stalwarts of our kind of current era side in Connor Cody, Ruben Neves and João Martinho. Now, Ruben Neves, first of all, I think is very much a player who I think when he's playing well, he's reading the game well. And a lot of his defensive work is probably where it's a, it's more of a, it's a better sign of him playing well when he's making interceptions, he's making tackles, he's getting stuck into the game, getting near to his opposite number. Now, that would have been Mateus Pereira, because if I show you the player um, position, average position map of the Wolves side, you can see he's kind of sat in that slightly deeper position, almost between centre-halves, um, you know, um, as a bit of a, what people kind of style as a quarterback, and we'll kind of come on to NFL references later on in the, in the video as well. But his right number was, like I say, Mateus Pereira, quite a talisman for um, West Brom as well. Now, I want to highlight the fact that as a kind of percentage, Mateus Pereira had about 10% of the, the all of West Brom's possession, really. That's a really good kind of um, figure for someone who is in the higher end of the pitch, the riskier part of the pitch. And for a team who haven't been um, attacking very well, getting him on the ball was very important to them actually producing something. Now, to my mind, why on earth a team like West Brom, who haven't scored anything, have hardly scored any goals this season whatsoever, felt like they could attack us, said a lot about the way we've been playing recently for a start. But it also goes to show that we weren't doing our jobs. And Pereira, if I show you his heat map, was picking up the ball in exactly the kind of zones that Neves needed to kind of protect and look after. Um, so there's a direct correlation there between Neves not doing very well and allowing West Brom to kind of build their way into the game. Now, if I show you that Neves didn't make a single interception in the game, that goes to show that he really wasn't at the levels that he needs to be. And um, I think it, a part of that was why um, we look so fragile defensively without real protection for our two centre-halves. So to stick with the theme of players being a heavy influence on their side, where Pereira did well, we didn't. Now, as I, as I, I kind of gave you that figure of 10% of the team's touches. Now, if we were to kind of match that up with a with a, um, a relative player from our own side, that would be Jao Martinho, who had around about 10% of, of what, according to who scored figures, 10% of what we did on the, on the pitch, basically, in terms of touches. And if I flash up his heat map, you can see straight away, everything is so much deeper. He wasn't able to make a real stamp of authority on this game something that you know as an example you know you look at the way we played against Tottenham similar situation where you know <laughs> West Brom actually showed a lot more ambition than Tottenham did in the end but we were able to stop them really building up any kind of momentum in attacking areas but Matinho, I mean if I show you what he managed to muster up in terms of getting the ball into the attacking third and also show you Ruben Neves and the way he didn't really muster anything into the attacking third either. It just it shows you how how lacking in fluidity we were. We really weren't progressing the ball at the pitch. And 
I can't tell you why that was the case, really. Players just seemed to underperform beyond any belief, um, and maybe the pressure had got to me on the, in terms of the occasion. But we were on a hiding to nothing um, with him playing like that, and he's so important to the way we move the ball that, as you can see here, the strikers are feeding off scraps, essentially. And we went on to score two goals, yes. Two set pieces, though, ultimately, and... Um, I just think we're really struggling with moving the ball into the final third and then once we get into the final third, moving, moving it as well. If I flash up, up until the kind of end of the goal scoring, um, you know, uh, at the point where it hit 3-2, how the game had gone in terms of the pass maps. The Wolves pass map, you can see very familiar patterns, you know, lots of side to side, lots of action in the wider areas, but anything in this kind of part of the pitch, very lacklustre. Obviously, West Brom packed the, their defence. They had the double pivot of Sawyers and Livermore, who were, you know, really kind of uh, protecting their back four. You know, and we kind of had Ruben Neves just on his own, kind of doing those kind of doggies side to side. But it really wasn't good enough in terms of, you know, actually the output that we managed to, you know, given the quality of play that we've got available to us as well, how we managed to, to kind of get into that area of the pitch. Whereas West Brom. <laughs> even in the, the, the vastly reduced amount of touches and passes and possession that they had, they actually kind of, you know, causes plenty of problems. They got the ball into the areas of the pitch that you want to when it comes to, when it, when it kind of comes to scoring a goal. And we know, you know, they scored off two penalties in set piece and there wasn't necessarily, you know, that many chances that we gave up, but they kept getting the ball into the areas that they could hurt us and um, subsequently they did. Now, if you have a look at kind of Cody, and uh, a lot has been made of him being substituted for the first time under Nuno in the Premier League. Uh, there's a bit of symbolism around that some people want to um, kind of consider, and that it's a sign of the times that we're under pressure, that Nuno's losing it a little bit, that there's going to be some kind of tiff in the in the changing rooms as a result and whatnot because of his kind of stance within the squad, he's the captain, he's his mouthpiece on the pitch and what have you. But there are a lot of footballing reasons as to why that substitution made a lot of sense. Now, as we all know, um, Cody at his best, with the ball at his feet, very, very important to the way we, we move the ball. Um, usually always got these kind of big switches out onto the flanks. Um, you know, sometimes mixes it up. If Neto's tucked in here, he's capable of playing that ball in between you know, playing it through the thirds into into the feet of the forwards and getting getting them on, on turn and and playing for them higher up the pitch and we're in defenders as well. But if we think about yesterday, really wasn't doing any of that. If I show you his pass map, so much of it is just side to side and, and not really gaining um, anything in terms of ground at the pitch, in terms of taking players out of the game. Does it getting the ball into our most dangerous players on a regular basis? He wasn't doing it. Now, if you throw in the fact that he'd given away a penalty, he looked shaky. He, he didn't look himself. He, he, he seemed to be carrying the pressure of Nuno's words pretty much that it was must game, must win game, that it was a black country derby, and that you know it was um, you know seriously affecting him. It seemed. And then, if you think about the fact that on a good day, and I'll show you this in terms of numbers, in terms of the way we progress the ball. Cody is very important, like I say, but he, he he delivers as well. He's, you know, gets us yards up the pitch with the ball at his feet and um, with his passing. Very important alongside Romain Saiz. If you take Willy Bolly out of the equation, the passing from the back has been very, very good in recent weeks. And when you have a look at what he managed to produce on, at the game on, on the weekend, nothing like what he would normally do. Obviously, he starts deeper than anybody else, so he has more pitch to kind of work with in terms of gaining yards at the pitch. He has, you know, almost every pass has to be forward in some kind of shape or form, unless he's trying to change the angle of the attack into his other centre half partner. But essentially, he wasn't doing enough of it. If you if you have a look at the fact that Romain Saez has got almost 500 yards gained um, from his passes during the West Brom game, and that was given the fact that he's playing left back and higher up the pitch as well. Just goes to show that it didn't make any sense not to take off size. What is he also he's also got a goal in him, offset pieces, nothing, not something we can say for Cody um, for sure. 
So getting him back into the centre half position and getting Ryan Aguirre out there as more of a thrusting kind of presence down the left was it, it made a lot of sense. You know, we can go on about the fact that Cody's captain, but nobody should be exempt from getting a substitute, and especially when we were chasing the game at the end of the day. Now it didn't work. Obviously, we, we, it was a bit of a maybe desperate attempt to, to kind of produce something, but ultimately, it didn't work. But at the same time, there, may, there was a lot more sense to that, having looked at all the kind of data around it than meets the eye. Now, just to touch on our attacking play, and it's a drum I've been kind of banging for a while now in the sense that we're not sophisticated enough in the attacking third. Um, if I flash up... Um, what is generally the, the kind of way that we look to attack teams, and it's, it's generally speaking um, dribbling past defenders. With players like Troyori and Neto, um, you, you can see straight away that dotted all over the pitch, we're, we're trying to take men out of the game by going past them. Now, I want to kind of compare it to American football in the sense that you, there's two ways of attacking in, in American football in possession. That's obviously by passing the ball, you know, gain yardage by um, finding runners, your wide receivers uh, and, and your other um, teammates from the quarterback. But there's also running it from the running back and um, which tends to be a bit more considered a more conservative way of going about things where you're gaining kind of shorter yardage, but much less likely to lose the ball in, in possession. I think that's the way we tend to approach it. We give the ball to try all right, just as an example, we'll get him out of here. Yes, he might have two or three players out there on him, but it's it's kind of great, fantastic if he manages to beat three men, which he does on so many occasions, to be fair to him, and you can't knock him for that. But if he loses the ball here, we're not really in a risky position to kind of get um, broken on to, you know, there's not, that's, not, that's not really an advantageous position for an opposition player to be in. And then, whereas if, say, you know, Willy Bolly was trying to find Fabio Silva in here, that pass could be cut out by this player and you could have three players on the break against your defence. And, you know, like I say, high risk, but a high reward as well if that kind of thing comes off. So, you know, you can see the Nuno's kind of pragmatism just in, in, in that right there. And I think if you think about the way the game was played from minute 56, which is when Albion scored their third goal um, until the end of the game, this was kind of the format, really, you know, deep defence, lots of possession from us. And uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's a way of breaking them down, but it's not ideal. If Troy is getting into this area of the pitch, which he does on so many occasions, generally speaking, we'll have, you know, a set defence to a double pivot midfield, Fabio Silva getting into the box, maybe then Donka, maybe Neto at the back post, but beyond that, Nothing else is really happening. And, um, you know, it, you've got to really try and pick out someone in that kind of scenario to, to create a real decent opportunity, which we didn't end up doing. The only one we did was when Katrani had that volley, which, you know, had a massive slice of fortune about it, really, in terms of the way it landed to him. Um, so, therefore, you, what you really need to do is move the ball a lot quicker. And um, I, I've done a little bit of an experiment, um, kind of mass experiment, to kind of work out how quickly we were moving the ball in that time period, and specifically from minute 56 onwards. And if you look at it as a kind of rule of thumb that two-thirds of a football match is spent with the ball in play, the rest of it is waiting for free kicks to be taken, yeah, you know, throw-ins, substitutions, um, you know, goalkeepers hanging onto the ball and setting up goal kicks, all that kind of thing. You look at it from, like I say, 56 minutes onwards. It's about 33 minutes considering the four minutes of added time. Two thirds of that accounting for West Brom being in possession of the ball at times as well. And you're left with about 18 minutes of Wolves um, being in possession across the whole of that time period. Now we made 204 passes um, in that in that section of, of time, which leaves us at a pass every 5.3 seconds. Now, if I was to kind of illustrate that to you by getting my stopwatch out and um, say I've just received the ball now, I've got time, I'm looking around, and finally I made a pass. That was about five and a half seconds, that was. Now, that figure is obviously an average, 
we are taking longer in certain occasions, we're taking we're going quicker in certain occasions. It doesn't account for obviously balls the ball being carried by like Neto and, and Traore who often will you know hold on to the ball for a bit longer in order to beat people and things. But I don't think that's quick enough to be um, you know, breaking down an organised defence. You've given the team opportunity to cut off passing lanes, to pressure you, to um, win the ball off you, you know, even force you backwards, all sorts of things which you know, a, t a set defence is, is just going to be more than happy with. So you have to move the ball a lot, lot quicker. You know, Troy is an absolute magnet for defenders. Nobody wants to leave him space. So when a team shuffles across like that, that has got to go quicker into there and then straight out of there where Neto's got a little bit more space to work with and attack that defence. But we don't do it quickly enough. And, you know, there's a confidence and a safety first approach that you know, really isn't, isn't kind of set up for us to do that. So that's all I'm going to say on the Black Country Derby. We've got to leave it behind us now. Um, honestly, I was uh, absolutely devastated, like I say, um, on Saturday. Um, it was like dealing with a child um, for my wife, to be honest, and um, I'm sure a lot of, lots of us were hurting. But I'm not going to do anything on the Chorley game. Quite frankly, if we don't get a result from, from that game, we won't be anything to do with uh, this kind of stuff. So um, what I will be doing, though, is halfway point in the season we've now reached in terms of league games. Bit of a half-term report, what we've done well, what we've not done so well, um, which is obviously more pertinent and things we can improve on. So keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for all the content that we've got coming out across all our social channels um, on, from Wolves Fancast at the moment. One of the pluses of being in lockdown has been that we've been able to kind of get, get a little bit more creative and, and come up with a lot more content for you and uh, give you guys plenty of stuff to sink your teeth into as Wolves fans in the absence of being able to go to games. So I hope you appreciate all that. Check out the podcast from the game. I've obviously um, I featured on that as well. So um, you can get more of my thoughts there alongside Luke. Ryan Hooper and um, Richard Hobbs as well. But from me for this week, it's uh, glad to put this one behind us, guys, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>